Hello friends, so um, we discuss about couple of preliminary treatment options uh, in the earlier lectures, we did talk about the screening. Today uh, in this lecture, we will be discussing the subsequent treatment uh, which is grit removal and then equalization which actually is an optional treatment system, optional treatment unit. To begin with, so in the screening that we discussed earlier, by screening we have already trapped the large floating materials, okay, those uh, who are coming along with the wastewater stream through the appropriate screens. Now, this large floating materials when uh, have already been retained, then uh, we intend to in the next unit which is grit, grit chamber, grit chamber is usually the second unit operation which is intended to remove grit from the wastewater. Now, grit is the heaviest material typically and that includes substances such as sand, coffee grounds, gravel, cinders with a significantly higher specific gravity. The specific gravity, typical specific gravity of grit materials is of the order of 2.6 or so. The range can be between somewhere between 2.4 to 2.65, which is much higher than that of typical organic solids. Now, grit removal is necessary to protect the uh, various equipments, pumps that are there in the treatment plant in the subsequent units because uh, you know that when uh, because up to screening the water may be coming in open channels or pipe or mostly by the gravity, but beyond this point forwards when we need to put water into the reactors at a controlled flow rate at a controlled discharge. So, we need to pump water, we need to uh, have se uh, several mechanical equipments like when the water goes to the aeration, so we need mechanical aerators or those kind of uh, systems. So, if we do not remove these heavy materials, these larger particles, then they may cause a disturbance or even a damage in the these mechanical equipments which will be operated subsequently. The, your pumps may get faulty, there might be abrasion or abnormal wear and tear. So, that is why the removal of grit is essential. Further, it also reduces the frequency of cleaning of the digesters and settling tank because subsequently we will see that uh, we go to the when we go to the primary sedimentation in the following lectures. So, uh, there the target is to settle the finer settle uh, settleable solids grit which can be easily settled because of very high specific gravity if we allow them to go through there. So, significant mass of this sludge will consist of grit only and uh, we need to because frequently clean the sludge zone of the subsequent systems. So, that also creates another problem. So, uh, since grit possesses a higher hydraulic subsidence value than typically organic solids. So, it can be easily separated from organic solids by differential sedimentation in grit chamber and the subsequent sedimentation could take place in the sedimentation chamber. Okay. So, the idea of grit removal is to basically trap those grit particles and settle them quickly. Now, both quality and quantity of grit varies based on various factors. These factors could include the type of uh, street surface encountered because wastewater typically flows in open channel. Now, if it is a lined system, unlined system, what kind of uh, surfaces it is being generated from, the type of inlet and catch basins, what is the kind of inlet and are we protecting any, um, are we having any protection at the inlet point. So, are we having any catch over there, those kind of uh, things also affect. Then the construction and condition of the sewer system, if it is a well lined system where no additional or uh, there is covering from the say top also. So, there is no additional material coming in over there, it will have lesser, but if it is exposed system or there is a lot of erosion because erosion of the your sewer system also adds lot of grit in the uh, sewage. So, uh, these are another factor then ground uh, 
and ground water characteristic if there is any seepage from ground water uh, those kind of uh, points will also be considered. The amount of storm water diverted through the uh, through over the flow points and your uh, night soil and other solids admitting into the sewer through the uh, dumping chutes and uh, pale depots. So, these are there then there are uh, relative area served, how large area is being served, what are the climatic conditions, what are the sewer grade and slopes, whether there are industrial waste incoming, okay, what is the social habit of the people, what kind of waste they are releasing into the sewerage system. So, there are these variety of factors that in combination leads to the quantity and characteristic of the grit which actually comes in the sewage. However, the grit is usually limited to municipal wastewater and generally not required for industrial effluent treatment plants except some industrial wastewater which may have grit because otherwise industrial processes are pretty, uh, pretty much organized and the kind of solids, the kind of materials expected to coming in in those systems are uh, fairly standard. So, in order to control, in order to have an eye on uh, like if your processes are coming from the controlled systems and you know that there is no possibility of such grit materials coming into the flow, coming into your industrial effluent, one may actually avoid grit removal from the industrial uh, systems. However, in municipal sewage, it is almost a certain unit that needs to be provided because our municipal uh, sewage typically comes from uh, open channel or these sewer lines and contains lot of grit material over there. The grit chamber can be classified in several ways okay, and the wastewater in grit chamber what actually happens that wastewater is passed into a wide basin which slows the wastewater velocity. The slower flow causes the grit to settle out because if you are having um, any particle, any heavier particle for, for say is likely to settle by the virtue of gravity. Okay, there is a gravitational force on these particles which tend to pull it down. Okay, however, when this particle is into a chamber or into a horizontal flow condition, so there is a horizontal flow velocity also acting on this. Okay, if your this will depend on its specific gravity and weight whereas, this will depend on the rate of discharge or the flow velocity of the system. If your flow velocity is substantially higher okay, as opposed to its settling velocity, the net movement of the particle will be something like this and actually particle will keep on flowing. But if you reduce this velocity component substantially low, so let us say this is your net magnitude of the settling velocity and this is just magnitude of horizontal flow velocity. So, your net velocity component or movement of direction become like this and then particle will eventually try to settle down and will not pass through. So, this is what is the basic principle behind the retention of suspended materials in the grid chamber or subsequently one in the sedimentation basin. So, this velocity the horizontal flow velocity is slows down slowed down. Okay and we allow the particles to settle. The various types of grid chamber depends on the flow and design. There is uh, a based on sources, the if you follow the CPHEO manual, so there is velocity controlled V shape longest grid channel, there is square shaped chamber with entry and exit on the opposite side of the mild hopper, there is vertex type conical chamber. Okay. So, uh, which basically works on a vertex action, the conical chamber like this. Okay. So, you can have various designs and various uh, sort of flow patterns in a grid chamber. Uh, several books one of the, like uh, Metcalf at these have there is horizontal flow grid chamber or which is rectangular or square in the configuration. There could be aerated grid chamber which is for the selective removal of grid with spiral flow aeration tank. So, there will be tank where basically there is a aeration spiral aeration kind of things will take place. There is vertex type grid chamber again uh, the one that was there in the CPHEO manual as well. Uh, 
EPA fat seed proposes uh, few more types of grid chamber. So, there is aerated grid chamber, there is vertex type which could be paddle or jet induced vertex, there could be uh, detritus tank which is short term sedimentation basin kind of thing, horizontal flow grid chamber which is based on the velocity control and there could be uh, hydrocyclones which is uh, cyclonic inertial separation of the grit from the water. So, there is uh, various principles which work on uh, such systems for the removal of grit. Now, if you go for the design of grit chamber, the design of grit chamber is primarily based on the settling of the particle, because as we discussed it is the, the prime objective of a grit chamber or grit removal system is to let the, the uh, heavier grit particles settle in the chamber. So, variations uh, of the sewage on hourly basis and typical value of minimum average and peak flows are first estimated okay, and then the velocity essential for the design of grit chamber is calculated based on that. So, grit chamber can be designed considering it as a typical sedimentation basin, this design is more or less similar. Okay. The only thing is that a specific gravity changes over here. So, grit settles as a discrete particles settling, we will discuss this different type of settling in the next lecture. So, uh, it settles as one independent individual particle at its own settling velocity, which eventually depends on the size and specific gravity of the particle. Okay. And of course, what is the viscosity of the water or viscosity of the sewage where it is trying to settle. So, if you see the guidelines presented in the CPHEO manual, the minimum size of grit is 0 0.2 mm with a preferable range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.15 mm, while the specific gravity of grit particles for design purpose is typically taken as 2.65. Okay. Now, the settling velocity for discrete particle is uh, generally given by the uh, transition law, which is the general equation for settling. So, settling velocity of a grid particle V s can be estimated as 4 by 3 g by C d rho s, which, which is the density of the grid particles minus rho, which is the density of the water divided by rho into d. Okay. So, this way you can uh, actually particularly this element if you see here. So, this can also be written as rho s by rho minus 1 and this is the specific gravity of the grid particle. So, this can also be written as say if you denote a specific gravity by s s. So, s s minus 1. Okay. So, this can this formula then become 4 by 3 g by c d s s minus 1 into d. Okay. Now, here if you see the c d is the drag coefficient. Okay which is typically approximated as 18.5 by r to the power 0 0.6, where r holds the Reynolds number which is from 1 to 1000 in the transition scale. The V s is the settling velocity which we are trying to estimate, the g is the acceleration due to gravity in meter per second square and as I said the rho s is the density of the grid particle and rho is the density mass density of the liquid or density of the water. Okay. And d is of course, the dia of the particle which we intend to settle. So, how we design it? We know that what size of particle we want to settle. So, let us say if you want to settle the grid particles of size 0 0.2 mm and higher. So, we our dia becomes 0 0.2 mm of course, we need to convert that in meter and then we know the specific gravity we take or consider a specific gravity of the particle say it is 2.65. So, then we know that 2.65 minus 1. So, we know the d, we know the specific gravity, we know the g, the c d is the one which is unknown to us. So, if we know the c d, we can estimate the velocity, settling velocity of the particle. Okay. So, that is uh, how typically the estimation is done. Now, for the design uh, practices, because we do not know the C d in the uh, we just were seeing that uh, slide earlier here. So, since C d is not known to us, okay, we are uh, we do not know what is actually the value of C d over here. So, without C d we cannot estimate the settling velocity. So, we 
start from an approximation and to begin with we consider the settling velocity of the particle with Reynolds number less than 1 which is typically given by the Stokes law. So, then our velocity becomes uh, if because if we follow the Reynolds number uh, if we follow Reynolds number less than 1. So, then we our equation typical equation reduces to this which is a typical Stokes law equation. So, g by 18 s s minus 1 d square by v d square by nu which is here nu is the kinematic viscosity. Okay. So, uh, if you see here we have the we know the dia of the particle we know the specific gravity we know the viscosity we know the g. So, we can estimate a settling velocity of the particle, but remember this settling velocity is not correct or may not be correct why it may not be correct because this is based on an assumption that our Reynolds number is less than 1 which may not be the case. This is based on an assumption when our Reynolds number is less than 1 and Stokes law is valid which may not be the case and that is why the settling velocity may not be the correct one. So, when particle size exceeds 1 mm and Reynolds number is typically above 1000 the C d is assumed to be 0 0.4 and the settling velocity then can be obtained from the Newton's law. So, this formula can also be adopted if we know that the particle sizes are uh, big enough and we want to sort of settle down in the uh, turbulent stage when your Reynolds number is above 1000 and then this formula can be used here also we know d, we know g, we know s s. So, uh, velocity can be computed. The settling velocity may also be obtained from the Hessen's modified equation for grid particle that is in the transition state. So, it is basically a temperature based equation. So, your settling velocity becomes 60.6 SS is known to us, di of the particle is known to us and then based on the temperature what temperature we want the process to be take place we can estimate the settling velocity. Now, these are the ways through which we can directly get the settling velocity, but these are based on certain assumptions that uh, our Reynolds number is less than 1 or more than 1. And as we know that Reynolds number is our uh, rho v g by mu. So, since you need uh, you need the knowledge or the number of velocity, you need the value of the velocity also in order to estimate the Reynolds number. And here we are estimating velocity based on the Reynolds number. Okay. So, it is a basically cyclic this thing and if we do not know what is the as, as the case is that if we do not know what is the actual velocity we cannot estimate the Reynolds number. If we do not know the Reynolds number we cannot estimate the drag coefficients and we cannot actually get the correct value of the settling velocity. So, for the purpose we begin with say assuming a Reynolds number less than 1 or if we know we can, uh, new, we can apply Hessen's formula or Newton's formula also, but if we are applying let us say the Stokes law for Reynolds number less than 1 and we are getting a velocity we need to once we know the velocity we need to cross check the Reynolds number we need to estimate the Reynolds number again and see if Reynolds number is matching that criteria or not. If Reynolds number is matching that criteria our estimate is correct. If not, we have to use this velocity and compute the Reynolds number and then based on Reynolds number compute the drag coefficient and put that drag coefficient into the uh, equation in order to get the settling velocity and do these cycles until unless the value of the velocity or value of the drag coefficient stabilizes. Now, the efficiency of a ideal settling basin uh, or ideal uh, grit basin will be expressed based on the settling velocity of the particle to be removed to the surface overflow rate. So, uh, this efficiency is typically the ratio of these velocities the surface overflow rate which is S O R or we refer to it as V 0 also is actually the ratio of flow of sewage to be treated in an ideal settling basin or ideal grid basin to the plan area of that tank which is equal to q by a because uh, flow is q and plan area is a and it is equivalent typically to the settling velocity of the particle removed completely in an ideal basin. Now, the surface area for the grid chamber is calculated on the basis of this surface overflow rate 
taken as a critical settling velocity for the desired particle size removal. So, once we know the settling velocity, okay, once we know the settling velocity, we can consider the our surface overflow rate as equal to settling velocity for ideal case. So, because if we assume this 100 percent removal, so our V s actually becomes equal to V 0. Now, if we know the V s from the equations that uh, we basically computed earlier based on the dia and the specific gravity of the particle and we know V 0 is equal to Q by A. So, from here knowing the discharge how much discharge is coming we can actually estimate what is the plan area required for the grid chamber. Okay. So, settling velocity and surface overflow rates for an ideal grid chamber at 10 degree Celsius as uh, basically given in the manual would be something like this your uh, for particle size 0.2 mm your uh, in the specific gravity 2.65 we have settling velocities as 0.25 meter per second and for smaller particle it is 0.1018 and the surface overflow rates would be of this order. So, that way we can uh, estimate the surface overflow rate and there we can actually get the area of the tank. Okay. And then once we know the area of the tank, we can basically dimensionalize it, put a length width or if we consider a circular basin, so we can determine the dia. But that is for the ideal settling basin and our settling tanks are not or, or our grid chamber or settling basins are not always work based on these idealized principles. In practice what happens that surface overflow rate has to be uh, diminished to account for non-ideal basin performance as there would be some degree of turbulence and short circuiting which is resulting from the ED wind or density currents. So, in real basin in actual basin which deviates from an ideal settling tank we can use this expression as suggested in the manual for the purpose of design. Now, if we assume here this is the desired efficiency. So, let us say if we assume 75 percent removal. So, our desired efficiency becomes 0 0.75 will be equal to 1 minus 1 plus n V s which is the settling velocity estimated for the particle okay. and Q by A which is your kind of overflow rate minus 1 by n. Now, here n is an index which is measured of the basin performance. Okay. So, again it is a sort of empirical value that has to be assumed. So, one can assume n as 1 by 8 for very good performance, 1 by 4 for good performance, half for poor performance and n is equal to 1 for very poor performance. Okay. So, based on these values if we assume n if we assume this efficiency. Okay. So, we know the n we know the efficiency we know the settling velocity. So, from this equation we can get the q by a and knowing the discharge we can determine the actual area of a real basin. Okay. Earlier we were discussing about the ideal basin, but this is about the real basin. So, like taking an example to achieve say 75 percent of removal efficiency in a grid chamber, if our design surface overflow rate or Q by A comes to be around 66.67 percent of the settling velocity okay, of the actual settling velocity. Earlier it used like in for an ideal basin it is equal to the settling velocity, but for a real basin for 75 percent removal efficiency it will be 66.67 percent when the performance is very good or n value is equal to 1 by 8. When this performance is good, so or n is equal to 1 by 4, then it is going to be around 58.8 percent. For a poor performance, it is going to be around 50 percent and for a very poor performance, it is almost going to be one third. Okay. So, that way in practice the value of anywhere between two third to one half are used in the design. Now, you see the two third is 66.67 percent is actually two third. Okay. So, this is your two third and half is this. So, you practically we assume our tank to be performing between some very good good or poor we do not consider very poor performance, but somewhere if even if our tank is performing from somewhere between very good to poor what we get is typically between two third to one half of the design depending on the type of grid chamber which is being used or which is being considered. 
Typically, an average flow and detention time in grid chamber should not exceed 60 seconds because the process is pretty fast and within a minute we can let the grid particles settle down. There is another criteria which needs to be seen when uh, because we are allowing the particle to settle and we are uh, the retention time is quite small. So, there has to be there, there will be some velocity component horizontal velocity component. This horizontal velocity component should not be that high so that it leads the scoring or the grit material which has settled down should not come back in the suspension. So, in order to prevent this uh, scoring process the critical velocity of this score is also estimated which is uh, the velocity beyond which particle of certain size and density actually may again come in the motion and will get reintroduced in the stream or will come back again in the suspension. And this critical velocity of scoring is typically calculated based on the modified seals formula. Okay. Now, this modified seals formula if you see is uh, the critical velocity of scoring is equal to uh, k c square root of your uh, g s s minus 1 into d where the k c values are taken between 3 to 4.5 and we know what g s s and d means. So, uh, that check needs to be performed and we need to see that the horizontal velocity in the tank should actually remain uh, lower than this critical scoring velocity, because if your ve horizontal velocity is reaches over critical scoring velocity, you may see the scoring of the particle happening. There should be minimum 2 units of manually clean grid chamber while mechanically clean grid chamber uh, uh, manually grid cham uh, in for the mechanically clean grid chamber a manually clean grid chamber should also be provided as a bypass. Because if you are just having say one unit mechanically clean unit and if there is a failure of the equipment one unit may be enough, but if there is a failure of the equipment then how you are going to remove the grid. So, as a bypass channel a manual grid cleaning chamber is also provided. For the velocity control grid chamber head loss varies from 0 0.06 to 6 meter depending on the device used for the velocity control and uh, the depending on how frequently it is being cleaned, what is the interval of cleaning, what is the additional depth for the storage of uh, grit needed can be estimated. Okay. If your frequency of cleaning is quite high you can leave a shallow depth for storage, but if your cleaning frequency is quite low you are cleaning let us say after several days. So, there has to be sufficient storage provided for the uh, grit which is being settled out okay. and towards the top of the tank a typically 150 to 300 meter freeboard is recommended bottom slopes are also based on the kind of scrapper mechanisms which is being provided in the grit chamber. Now, how we clean grit, grit typically can be removed manually or mechanically. However, manual cleaning, uh, manual clearing of the grit should be avoided in case of uh, large STPs. If your STP is very small say less than 1 MLD, so the amount of grit deposited is not that high and one can go for manual cleaning, but in the larger STPs or larger treatment plants when there is a lot of grit depositing, so manual cleaning becomes quite difficult. So, one should go for mechanical cleaning in such systems and the equipments that are provided for collection as well as washing of grit by agitation mechanism typically can be operated either on a continuous or intermittent basis. The settled grit which basically settles on the floor is collected through scrapper blades or plugs and then elevated to the ground level by uh, various mechanism which can include bucket elevators, jet pumps or uh, screw and air lift. In intermittently operated type when we are not operating the grid chamber on a continuous mode, okay, we just operate grid chamber only normally once or twice a day, there has to be sufficient storage capacity to hold the grid between the intervals of grid elevation and uh, accordingly provision should be given. The cleaning of grit is basically uh, the, is essential and if you see the clean grit because typically grit materials are what the uh, cells, glands, larger those kind of particles and they generally do not have any order. So, clean grit is typically orderless 
and may be deposited by dumping or burying okay, or by going for sanitary landfills. Okay. If not washed, it may contain certain organic matter also because wastewater contains lot of organic matter and some may get settled and those organic matter may add some sort of order and then it is not suitable for disposal. So, grits is typically washed before disposal. Okay. The ultimate method of disposal will depend on the how much quantity is being generated and what is the characteristic of those particles and further how much what kind of facilities, what kind of infrastructure, what kind of land is available. If there is sufficient land you can just go for dumping or burying, okay. uh, but uh, orderless grid particles are typically buried because it is anyway uh, those kind of sediment material. So, they can be typically buried. Uh, um, unless you wash them properly. Okay. The one which is having order needs to be uh, buried subsurface and uh, otherwise you wash them and then you can go for o like open dumping or other processes because uh, you need to be careful about the order arising as well. Now, um, there is uh, let us quickly discuss another unit which is equalization tank it is actually an optional unit. Okay. Uh, the domestic or industrial wastewater streams where there is a significant variation in terms of wastewater flow as well as quantity okay, uh, as well as quality or uh, characteristic. Then we provide a equalization tank to ensure the consistent flow and quality of the influent which is passed through subsequent treatment units and thereby avoid hydraulic and organic shocks uh, coming on to the subsequent units. Now, equalization tank is optional because often the larger STPs there is already significant or continuous inflow coming in. The characteristic does not change too much because the reason or the sources are municipal primarily the municipal uh, effluents, municipal wastewaters. So, there is no large variation in terms of quality or quantity and that is why the equalization tank can easily be avoided uh, for the uh, large STPs. But if it is a smaller STP then uh, the kind of flow coming in may vary a lot or particularly industrial process. So, depending on the process when there is a operation going on you will see very little discharge when the operation is completed lot of wastewater is released at once. So, uh, there is possibility of such kind of variations in terms of quality as well as in terms of quantity because many times you see the quality also varies the kind of if particularly from the industrial processes you are uh, have when you are just washing floor and those kind of things. So, the water which is coming is of very uh, like uh, mildly contaminated or very little contaminated, but the water which comes out of industrial processes may have substantial degree of contamination in it. So, there is this possibility of having these variations. Okay. Now, uh, we provide an equalization tank in order to control this in order to balance the fluctuating flows and concentrations. It also helps in assisting the self neutralization of this and even out the effect of periodic slug which discharges in a batch processes because many places in particularly in the industry many uh, times this waste is discharged in the batch processes and that needs to be even out. The benefits is that shock loading is eliminated or minimized and therefore, the subsequent biological process are enhanced. This is fairly important because otherwise your biological processes or the microorganisms or subsequent uh, like bacteria and those things will be susceptible sometime they will get very high organic load there might be some toxicants also available in it. Okay, and they have to deal with it and sometime they will get very diluted waste and probably not of enough of the organic matter present in the waste to uh, fulfill their metabolic demands. So, they basically remains in a state of shock and their performance dips. So, uh, their uh, performance of the such processes cannot be consistent in that case if they are getting a uh, shock loadings in terms of flow or in terms of quantity uh, in terms of quality. The effluent from biological treatment have better quality and improved thickening uh, if we uh, put through a equalization tank or put through a controlled uh, flow. Effluent filtration surface area requirements are reduced okay, with improved filter performances. The important ones are that 
the particularly the chemical fleet control processes becomes more reliable, the risk of the plant failure reduces and the protection against the higher level of toxic loads is also reduced. Because if there is a toxic load coming in a very high concentration and you put through an equalization basin allow the larger flow coming in and then there is a self neutralization takes place and by the time you pump that water to the subsequent units that uh, the effect of that periodic slug or very high concentrations has already almost diminished. Typically, there are uh, three types of uh, equalization tank, there is one flow through type equalization tank okay, uh, which is kind of uh, the water that is coming in will actually be uh, it is a kind of inline system. Okay. So, one side water keeps on coming and another side water keeps on uh, going out. There is intermittent type flow tank okay, where is uh, we can have intermittent inflow or intermittent outflow okay, with a constant inflow against constant outflow and there are variable inflow and constant discharge type. So, inflows are variable many times uh, actually uh, these equalization tanks becomes essential when your sources of water is different. So, let us say in CETPs when you are uh, in common effluent treatment plants when you are getting waste inflow say from 5 different industries. Now, these 5 have different characteristic if you do not equalize them. So, when this passes to your subsequent unit your process are going to be different because the nature of the contaminants are different when this passes your nature of contaminant becomes different. So, it is better to basically keep them have them in a mixed unit let them homogenize and then you pump a sort of standardized quality of waste or stabilized quality of uh, waste for the to the subsequent units. Many times you are getting let us say a industrial uh, discharge and a domestic uh, sewer line also. So, there is a, there are like you in Kanpur we have a treatment plant where these are treated together. The problem is that industrial will have high load, this will have very low load, this will have very high volume, this will have relatively lower volume. So, until unless you neutralize them, you mix them, the subsequent process again will become very risky. So, these are the important aspects. The optimum location of the uh, equalization tank will vary according to the collection of the system, according to the uh, waste water that needs to be handled what is the land requirement, what is the availability and type of uh, subsequent treatment is being planned. So, all this uh, needs to be considered. If you see the volume requirement for equalization basin, again this will uh, depending uh, this typically is estimated based on the info cumul uh, inflow cumulative volume diagram and uh, where basically cumulative inflow volume is plotted against the time of the day. Okay. So, uh, it will be like this if let us say this is my time. So, this is my 0 hour, this is my 24 hour and this is my cumulative volume. So, uh, what happens traditionally that at the time of there is uh, no volume or very low volume and then in the morning hour the cumulative volume increases and then the increase will not be much say in the afternoon. Okay. In the evening again you will see this cumulative volume increasing okay. and then in the night again it might be get subsidized. If you see the average of this you will find something like this okay. that is uh, like if you plot a linear this thing you may find like this, but this is obvious that in the morning hours we have high demand. So, cumulative volume will increase this way and in the later on it can decrease this way. So, we take the slope of this peaks maximum and minimum peak and the difference in the slope is actually the volume of the equalization tank needed, because this is the maximum storage volume that will be needed if you are pumping through this way. So, this is the additional volume or the, the required volume that needs to be pumped. So, that way this the this becomes the volume of the equalization tank which uh, for which it needs to be designed. Of course, there would be uh, retention time criteria for how long you want to retain it. Okay. Uh, 
Now, uh, there are other factors that considered for design, what is the basin geometry, what is the construction, what is the mixing and air equipments, if there are any operational uh, appurtenances and what are the kind of pumping system. So, these are the additional this thing, you can uh, we can have uh, inline equalization basin. So, we are having let us say screen then grit removal and then we can have a equalization basin and from here through flow meter we can supply water for subsequent processes or we can have an offline equalization basin where let us say if this is your effluent this is grid chamber. So, we can have a overflow structure and the overflow of them is coming to the equalization tank and from here we can have a controlled flow pumping system. Here also we can have a pumping system. So, depending on whether we need this or we do not need this we can operate it. Okay, or if not required we can omit it also and then the flow can be pumped directly through the flow meter to the subsequent treatment systems. So, this is the uh, kind of importance of equalization tank and this is how it is designed based on its cumulative uh, flow that it needs to retain over a period of day. The typical retention time could be uh, something from 2 to let us say 8 hours or so for the equalization tank. Okay. The location of equalization tank also varies depending on the uh, objective of the equalization tank. Normally, uh, if even if we are let us say having different streams, so the screening and grit is done independently and then we can put through a equalization and from this point forwards we can have a controlled release to the subsequent treatment systems. Many uh, not many, but a few places equalization tank is even placed after primary sedimentation basin. Okay. So, after primary settling when we go for the biological or secondary treatment systems, we can opt for the equalization basins from that point forwards. So, uh, we will stop the discussion for the time being and in next class we will have discussion on to the primary settling or primary sedimentation which is uh, one of the very prime units for the uh, wastewater treatment under the primary treatment category. Thank you.